The third ordinary session of the 2024 legislative year, largely dedicated to the scrutiny of the 2025 state budget, opens tomorrow. In Yaoundé, both houses of parliament are set for the start of as lawmakers stream into town with expectations. The emergency squad on the Chang Cliff continue work to deter bodies and vehicles buried in the mudslide. Efforts are underway to construct a secondary road that avoids the steep and mountainous nature of the cliff. Cameroon's markets in dire need of safety against ravaging flames. Authorities are tasked to sh cut short random and unsystematic electrification, provide emergency exits and invest in modern day firefighting remedies. Those were the headlines of the 730 News. Thanks for joining us. I am Esther Kima. We begin with news from the Star Building where the Regional Director of the United Nations Population Fund for West and Central Africa has acknowledged Cameroon's support during the 30th anniversary of the International Conference of Population and Development. Dr. Senen Huntun expressed the gratitude at an audience granted him today by Prime Minister Head of Government Joseph John Gute. Christian Chair Atama Star Building Correspondent tells us more. 2024 has been an important year for the United Nations Population Fund, the UNFPA. The organization commemorated the 30th anniversary of the Cairo International Conference on Population and Development, which produced the working documents of the organization, and Cameroon played an active role in the events. That is why the UNFP, a regional director for West and Central Africa, was full of thanks for the government of Cameroon during his visit. Cameroon has been beside us throughout the Global Conference on Population and Development in New York, but also throughout the Summit of the Future with His Excellency, the President of the General Assembly, Ambassador Philemon Young, who has helped us position the key issue, which are the investment in youth, the investment in women and girls. Joseph Diangute and the UNFPA official also examined ways of enhancing the action of the organization in Cameroon so that we can know how best to serve Cameroon through our country program. I also made some advocacy, uh, contribution of Cameroon uh, to the core funding of the organization, but also on the census, which, as you know, is a critical, uh, important exercise to plan development. Prime Minister Joseph Diangute reassured the UNFPA official that the protection of the rights of women and youths remains a major preoccupation to the government of Cameroon. In one of our top stories, the third ordinary session of the 2024 legislative year begins tomorrow in Yaoundé with lawmakers of the Senate and the National Assembly thrown into the nation's capital in preparation of the last budgetary session of the head of state's current seven-year mandate. The clerks of both houses, accompanied by their close aides, inspected the disposition for hitch-free deliberations. Charles Abonnet reports on this as well as on the stakes of the last ordinary session of the year. They are on the conference center, the temporal site of the bicameral parliamentary institution. Today, on the eve of the last parliamentary session of the year, the Senate administration inspects how ready is the avenue to host the 100 chamber house for the latest gathering. I can say without fear or without any ambiguity, except the Lord says differently, that we are ready accompanied by operational directors of the Central Administration of the Senate and the Protocol Service, the acting clerk checks the sitting positions are well arranged for the start of the session this Tuesday. The decoration is ready and um, we have taken all the necessary disposition. The translation unit is ready and all the documents ready. The same scenario is observed in the same building as far as the National Assembly is concerned. We are ready. We have done the round, the traditional rounds. And uh, from the house chamber, commonly called the hemicycle, everything is set. The central administration of the National Assembly has ensured all dispositions are put in place for a huge free start of the November session, whose key feature is the next state budget examination and related actuality-based issues. I am expecting that the financial bill gives to us 
uh, elements to achieve what people are waiting for. And with news that all the key actors of the event, that is, senators and National Assembly members, are all already in Yaoundé, Parliament is set to start this Tuesday. In diplomacy, Cameroon is strengthening its relations with Algeria and a glaring example of the Entente is Cameroon's participation in celebrations marking the struggle for Algeria's independence. The minister delegates in charge of defense at the Presidency of the Republic, Joseph Beti Asomo, was part of the event in Algeria after which exchanged with officials of Cameroon's embassy in Algeria. Details in this report with Irene Gauda. Invited by Algerian President Abdel Majid Taboum, Minister Betty Asomo participated in the commemorations of November 1st, marking the beginning of the Algerian struggle for independence. This visit is a testament to the strong bilateral cooperation between the two countries rooted in a shared history of liberation struggles. De la République du Cameroun, chef de, de nos forces armées, son Excellence Monsieur Poudier, pour venir honorer une invitation spéciale du gouvernement algérien. During a solemn ceremony held at the Cameroonian Embassy in Algeria, Minister Betty Asomo reflected on the French occupation of Africa in the 1950s, a dark period in the history of both countries marked by thousands of deaths and disappearances. The ties between Cameroon and Algeria date back several decades. Today, this cooperation is reflected in numerous bilateral agreements in various fields such as economics, education and defense, as evidenced by the many Cameroonian trainees attending this ceremony to whom the minister recommended discipline and rigor in their work. Away from diplomacy, our newsroom focus tonight is on the recurrent fire outbreaks in markets across the national territory. In recent times, hardly will a month go by without a distress call from traders following the ravaging of their goods by flames. From the Bamenda Min Market to Mbopi Indwala and the Marwa Min Market, the major cause identified has been poor electrical connections compounded by the absence of emergency exits. Alphonse Abongwa now paints a picture of how markets go aflame in the country. An entangled cobweb formation of electrical cables with no definite starting or ending point. The Mbopi market in Douala shines bright in this anarchy. This is why it is a regular hot spot for infernos in the country. Bad wiring. Some of us forget our meters. We don't put them off. And when they cut light like this, when the light is coming back, it comes with power and sometimes it destroys the source. That is why you see mostly in the night you have you hear that the market is getting burned. The substandard quality cables used to electrify these markets renders it even easier for a spark to degenerate into uncontrollable flames. La qualité du fil. The quality of cables also put us in serious trouble. You may connect a cable and after electricity is re-established, the strength of the current burns the cable. As blurry as these connections appear, so too is the network that manages the bills linked to them. There are people who collect bills without knowledge of the source of energy. Someone creates his line and starts supplying current to people. You find a connection from here in Longkak to the central market without knowledge of who connects it. People just pay. Another mathematical equation scouting for answers is poor evacuation plans. Access into and out of most markets in Cameroon gives reason to worry. If you look at that area that you, uh, we have the fire incident now, you, we can see blockage. Experts say fire outbreaks in markets may not be eradicated but can be mitigated. 
With access roads completely blocked by traders and haphazard electrification still thriving in local markets, a good number of traders have opted for the purchase of preventive and protection fire equipment. Some have installed fire alarms, smoke and heat detectors, as well as fire extinguishers available in hardware stores. Cynthia Saptola reported that fixing these firefighting devices will considerably save markets from ravaging flames. A complete firefighting equipment here on display sold at 110,000 CFA francs. This is just one of the many fire safety apparatus sold in a few hardware stores in the heart of town. Fire extinguishers are available in markets and they are one of the most reliable because it stops the fire from its source. We have smoke detectors which can cause an alarm and alert everyone and fire extinguisher balls. Other modern tools include photoelectric alarms, warning devices, aspirating smoke detectors, and fire blankets. Experts state that having these equipments in commercial buildings or recreational sites is necessary provided they are properly utilized. We put these fire extinguishers in the market we are building, but can the population use them is the real question. There are exit roads, water circuits, but I believe we have to train people on what to do uh, when there is a fire. If you fuck me. Beside these fire safety appliances, experts insist that respecting fire safety measures and electrical connection norms during constructions is also key. We need to implement modern installations that respond to security norms. I mean constructions that take into account the circulation of goods and people, the evacuation or access to firefighters. Apart from fire extinguishers, vendors disclose a majority of these fire detection equipments are only available by other. Reason being the demand isn't as it should be. Given that markets are prone to fire hazards, it is incumbent on municipal management teams to ensure their safety. For some council officials, the best remedy is a holistic approach which entails building market structures that are inflammable with proper layouts accessible to fire tenders. Beatrice Lawson reports that apart from awareness on fire safe habits and same electrical wiring, surveying markets against arson is, is essential. Investigations on the cause of fire incidents reveal poor electrical wiring or flammable market structures as the catalysts. Pointers to what councils as managers of these markets should consider to reduce the chances of fire events. For the oil market, it's important to, to rehabilitate the system, the electrical uh, system. With decentralization, each council has to organize its markets. We have to build modern markets. Making sure the infrastructure has proper layout to ease access to fire tenders is said to be of paramount importance. In my council, we let business people build their shops, restaurants, kiosks and stands. Our role now is to extend passages, light up spaces, widen pavements, and watch the exits and entrances. The people in the markets are key to its safety. Councils anticipate rules for them, like avoiding to cook in the open, limiting use of generators, and much more. The, the economic operator, if they don't make a, a well use of the equipment, it can be the, the, the principal causes of the fire. It's important for us to have SMD wishes in their shop. The dream of fire safe markets includes market surveillance systems to detect arsonists. Security officers might just have to be in the permanent market picture as councils project integrating all actors and sectors in this holistic approach to fire management in markets. And halfway into our newscast, we now take on this developing story. The rescue and emergency team stationed at the site where the most slide occurred at Inchang Cliff last week continued to work tirelessly to retrieve the corpses and vehicles submerged by earth. Administrative and local authorities have been joined by volunteers and distressed families in the search where a couple of bodies have already been identified. Kelvin Nembu reports on the work 
of the search team so far. No time to rest. Council workers are on the site of the disaster with officers of fire and rescue units from Chang'an Bafusam. They continue to search for bodies still buried in the rubble. We are there with two caterpillars. A part of two caterpillars, we have four groups. There's two groups, they in floor. The other two groups, they rest. After with the permit, we the go, with the dig more than five meters to see if we can see somebody. While excavators are being used to dig through the mud and rocks, there are volunteers, made up of mostly family members of the victims, still in shock while using shovels. My My mother left Sancho for Chang when the last slide occurred. We are searching for the bodies together with officers of the fire and rescue units. He arrived here, then went to greet one of the workers. Then suddenly, the second landslide occurred. Despite the difficult terrain, the search is on, and family members of the victims pray it will only stop when all the bodies have been recovered. 730 News wishes courage to all the affected families. And with the rubble still present on the Chang Sancho stretch, it has been impossible for vehicles to ply the road. To ensure that passengers get to their destination, public works officials and council authorities are strategizing on the construction of a deviation with feasibility studies being finalized. Eric Langmia Rufo reports that exploring an old German road is an option as they've been instructed to avoid the steep and mountainous parts of the area. Technicians from the Ministry of Public Works are working closely with the Chang Council and the division is set to be carried out on a road that was constructed by the Germans. The first uh, thing we have done was to send our technician on the field. They have started in this place calling Kaufu uh, Plantain and uh, they have taken the route built by the German, and uh, we know that that route on that route we don't have mountain, and it's something like 24 kilometers when you leave Ntenge, which is in Chang. But before uh, this uh, falls, the construction of the road will also take into consideration environmental impact assessment with studies aimed at avoiding any negative consequences on the population. Traffic, however, has been redirected to the Bafan Kekem Road. The stretch is currently set to be experienced in maintenance works. In economic news, the implementation of the import substitution policy in Cameroon aimed at boosting local production and economic development is at the center of the third edition of the Douala Economic Forum. Decentralized collectivities have been drilled on local policy orientations and empowerment of small-scale entrepreneurs. Cynthia 18 reports on day one of the forum in the nation's economic capital, Douala. Courtyard of the Sawa Cultural House has been transformed into a vast commercial space with exhibitors amongst whom local producers gradually occupying the various stands. The first day of the Douala Economic Forum in its third edition dwelled on training sessions around local policy and the promotion of import substitution, intercommunal dialogue and the promotion and funding of local potential as well as the dynamics of made in Cameroon. We have noticed that the state can count on the centralized local authorities to fully implement its import substitution policy because the 2019 law permits local authorities to create enterprises. The economic forum to run for five days is unfolding on the theme transport logistics and the real estate industry as elements of attractiveness of the city of Douala. Let's not forget that Douala is the starting point of the sub-regional integration corridor. As such, transport infrastructure and lodging facilities must be at the center of investments at the level of local and public policy. The official open slated for Wednesday, November 13, will be presided over by the governor of the littoral region, Samuel Diodoneva Dibua.
From the littoral to the south region, the construction of the Bolova branch of the Bank of Central African States, BIAC, is advancing satisfactorily. The bank's governor, Yvonne Sanabangi, was at the site in the presence of the governor of the south region, Felix Ngelengele, to inspect the project expected to be completed by the first quarter of 2025. Clarence Aze tells us more. The first part of call of Mr. Yvonne Sanabangi in Bolova was a courtesy visit to South Governor's office. Both officials then visited the construction site of the Bolova branch office of Biak at the Angonewa neighborhood. Even though no information was disclosed on the project technicalities and work progress, the three-story building nonetheless has taken shape pending finishing touches. Addressing the press at the end of the tour, Mr. Yvonne Sanabangi said the visit was crucial to monitor and ensure the successful completion of the project which is part of President Bia's vision for Cameroon's emergence by 2035. The high-level official also announced that the Bolova branch of the Bank of Central African States will hopefully be inaugurated by mid-2025. He also chaired an in-camera session intended, amongst other issues, to evaluate the current state of construction against project timeliness and goals, discuss any obstacles or concerns with the construction team and stakeholders, and to provide guidance on key areas to focus on. For timely completion. The Biak governor's involvement demonstrates the institution's commitment to expanding its presence and enhancing services in the South region which shares borders with Congo, Gabon and Equatorial Guinea. What constitutes the talk of the day? It has been rumored that beverages and beer products in the country have experienced a price increase. Members of the National Syndicate of Brewery Depots clarify that since November 1, there has, however, been an additional charge for loading, quality control, and bottling imposed on them. This has pushed some vendors to increase the cost of the products by 400 francs. For some, Larry's Nane Epote has been finding out what obtains for the 730 News. Information from bars and snacks indicates a bottle of beer is sold to consumers at at least 700 CFA francs. The official price of beer is 650 CFA francs, but curiously, I bought a bottle at 700 francs. A crate of beer previously sold at 7,200 CFA francs is now being sold at certain depots at 7,800 CFA francs. This change is attributed to the new fees imposed on them by the brewery company referred to in French as Fred d'Enlèvement. Since the 1st of November, we are being imposed on the Fred d'Enlèvement. Brasserie adds 600, so we are forced to add 600 to our prices. Some vendors explain that the increase in the price of a bottle of beer to 700 CFA francs rather than the 650 CFA funds set by the Ministry of Commerce is due to the additional services they provide to customers. The final product is sold to us at 650 francs, but we sell in our bars at 700 francs because we have additional services. In bars, customers will insist the one cold beer, the one chairs, air conditioner, comfort and TV. Those are added values they are paying for. A recent communique signed by the Minister of Commerce reminds consumers that the prices of beer remain unchanged. Nevertheless, it is up to consumers to understand the official price list and choose where to consume the product, as the cost of drinking in bars may vary based on the type of extra services provided by the establishment. And hopefully, Larus, the Ministry of Commerce, will bring that situation under control in the coming days. And now on to developments of the Martinez Zogo assassination case. The Yaoundé Military Court has rejected all exceptions and requests to review issues of disrespect of privacy, arrest and search without warrants, as well as the reenactment of the act. The Defence Council of the 17 accused now have 48 hours to appeal. Failure will prompt the court to pass judgment on the December 2, 2024. Kilian Dandifon was at the hearing and our reports. The Yaoundé Military Tribunal was requested, among several issues by the Defence Council, to declare null and void the report of the investigating magistrate of the Martinez Go assassination case and to reenact the facts. There were some 15 other exceptions relating to arrest and home search without warrant. The court rejected and declared all of them premature and lack of substance. 
The judge does not yet have a report. Without the report, he cannot rule. That is why he says it is premature. It is only when the debate is opened, they argued, that the judge will have the facts and act on them. I still say that if the debate is not opened to have facts, the judge cannot rule. The defense counsel stands on the position of court procedure. We came to court for the judge to declare the accused innocent or guilty. His role is to judge, punish offenses, and when an act is illegal, it is annulled, wrongly written, it is cancelled. This way, the only path is to appeal, which will take a long time again for us, the lawyers. C'est quand même assez gros pour nous. Comme je le dis encore pour nous les avocats. The chief judge, Colonel Misen John Jacques, adjourned the case to December 2, 2024, after 13 minutes of hearing, the shortest since the start in March this year. In other security news, a mobile application to curb the rising rates of insecurity experienced by commercial motorbike riders has been introduced in Yaoundé. The tech innovation called Seacoast Motors enables the bike riders trace their bikes in case of theft by simply providing their personal data to the base required. Carrying to some reports on the app, which is a relief for many. In recent times, several acts of banditry have reportedly been carried out through the use of motorbikes in Yaoundé, a situation that motivated these tech enthusiasts to develop an application. Each bike operates in a municipality, and so we identify the bike first, the bike owner and the rider. Then they will be given a QR code which permits them to circulate freely. They also have vests with their pictures on it to enable passenger safety. The developers add that the application is also to help various authorities to keep track of happenings around their community. It enables the administration to have control over actors in the sector. For security personnel, it permits them to guarantee the security of persons and their goods, and most importantly for councils, who are the key actors in this project. After presenting it to the public, they plan to move to the councils to sign partnerships and then start the implementation phase in the Fundi division. This week's running series on the 7.30 News is on the growing interest the population has on personal development coaches, also known as life coaches. They help individuals improve their lives and reach their goals with expert advice on identifying challenges, setting goals, and developing strategies for positive change. The majority of these personal growth coaches get their training from schools, while others simply gain knowledge from crash courses, as Emmanuel Avemi reports. Call them soft skill developers or better still professionals who help individuals tap into their full potential. A personal development coach is uh, a professional uh, who works with clients to achieve uh, certain goals. These skill sets are not necessarily learned in school. It begins with a need. The individual then reaches out to a life coach who takes it from there. It could be that Hey, I want to be more confident. You set a working plan with this client. They may have group sessions, one-on-one -on -one sessions. Without personal development, there is no promise for emancipation. A personal development basically constitutes mental development, emotional development, behavioral development, and temperamental development. Career development, relationships, and personal growth are just a few areas of influence. Personal development has helped us to achieve uh, very powerful projects in education, uh, family education, education even across various belly weeks and even in early childhood education. I work with women predominantly. We talk about it could be wardrobe, it could be makeup sessions, but the most important part is from the inside out. As a coach, the client has to do the work. I did come up with a manners for kids the African way and uh, it was a hit because I wanted to teach the children our culture upbringing. Formal education or crash courses online are options to get life coaching skills. I read a lot 
I worked with great mentors to become a leader. 15 to 20,000 CFA friends a session in Cameroon and more elsewhere. Life coaching skills are paid for. In other news, 17 universities from across the country are taking part in the 10th edition of the University Arts and Culture Festival in Douala. Presided over by the Minister of State, Minister of Higher Education, Professor Jacques Famindongo, the festival is a contest for the best exhibitions of Cameroon's rich and cultural diversity. Madon Kwele reports that it is themed on artistic and cultural ingenuity and added value to the creation of enterprises in the school milieu. Close to 1,500 youths accompanied by 400 supervisors from 17 state and private universities are displaying their creativity and originality at the 10th edition of the University Festival of Arts and Culture in Douala. I'm from the University of Edouard. We are here to win and we cannot go back without the trophy. I come from the University of Boya. I will stand for bilingualism and um, civics and patriotism. Yes, I promise to give my best to win. The Minister of State, Minister of Higher Education and Chancellor of Academic Orders, accompanied by Transport Minister jean Ernest Masenangale Bibeye, called on the students to give their best and uphold Cameroon's arts and culture, a catalyst to the country's economic growth. Through your artistic ingenuity, your creations and your performances, our national integration will be magnified. May friendship, talent, ethics, equity, and fair play be the only guide through your efforts throughout this festival. The ceremony was attended by university rectors, school administrative officials, and other guests from the littoral region and beyond. The festival shall end on November 16, 2024. <laughs> In sports, the Indomitable Lions of Cameroon are getting set for the remaining two qualifying matches for the 2025 Afghan. The Minister of Sports and Physical Education, Professor Narcis Molekombi, has called for seriousness in order for the team to maintain its winning spree. Nana Walter Wilson sat through the preparatory meeting for the encounters on November 13 in Johannesburg and November 19 in Yaoundé. Here's his report. Following Cameroon's qualification uh, to the AFCON 2025 in the Kingdom of Morocco before the close of the ongoing qualifiers, the Sports and Physical Education Minister, Professor Nassis Bonacombi, on behalf of the people and government of the Republic of Cameroon, has congratulated Coach McBreeze and his team. The sports minister was speaking in the conference room of his ministry Monday as he chaired a preparatory meeting for the remaining two matches, Namibia versus Cameroon in Joburg, South Africa, 13, and Cameroon versus Zimbabwe for the November 19th in Yawande. On their part, the National Sporting Infrastructure Agency is set for the November 19 match. Onifo Stadium is ready as usual. We are now just polishing some few items to make sure that the site is perfect to receive the competition. There is no single worry on the pitch and all the technological system. Everything is ready for the match to take place on the 19th. Meanwhile, Coach McBreeze and his players will leave Cameroon for South Africa in the early hours of Tuesday with a call for all the stakeholders to ensure total success. On today's advertorial, lawmakers have been assessing the functioning of the cement production company, Cementcam. They were at the company branch in order to make an evaluation of the respect of their corporate social responsibility given the health complications caused by their activity. Rabiatu Jingi Abdulaziz has the details. The challenges faced by Cementcam and its innovations carried out so far are the lead motive of the visit of some members of parliament to cement camp to have a better understanding of the functioning of their company. We came to ensure that cement camp is operating within a context where if they were to face with any challenges like happened to Sonara, uh, the government would not be embarrassed. We equally came to look at uh, the social responsibilities of this company whether they are actually doing what they should be doing to the hosting communities, to the Cameroonians as a whole. With the stiff competition in the cement sector in Cameroon, 
The 19-man delegation of parliamentarians and senators is a sigh of relief to the top management of Simenkam as they can always trust on the government for continuous support. We are very honored uh, to get the visit of the parliamentarians. It's a privilege uh, to expose uh, and to present the situation of the cement market uh, in Cameroon, uh, to have time to exchange, to listen to the concern of the people of Cameroon and to explain what is the plan of the company, the plan of the company for the, for the future. Created in 1963, Simenkam has moved from its baby steps to a giant cement factory in Central Africa with the production of a wide range of cement products. As part of the company's social responsibility, Simenkam has created platforms for exchanges with its stakeholders and local residents' committees so that together they can give directives for their actions. They can also contribute for the education, health, employability and hygiene of their personnel. The Simenkam company has also contributed to the construction of the country's major architectural works like the bridge over the Vuri and the Nashtigal Dam. That's where we end this edition of the 7.30 notes in which you mainly heard that the third ordinary session of the 2024 legislative year largely dedicated to the scrutiny of the 2025 state budget opens tomorrow in Yaoundé. Both houses of parliaments are set for the start of as lawmakers stream into town with loads of expectations. And finally, the emergency squad on the Chan Cliff continue to work to deter bodies and vehicles buried in the mudslide. Efforts are underway also to construct a secondary road that avoids the steep and the mountainous nature of the cliff. More news comes up in under 30 minutes with Romeo Tristan Gok. I'll be back tomorrow at 7 30 p.m. Cut willing. Stay tuned to our programs on CRTV and on CRTV News. Good night and thanks for watching.